afternoon, everyone. And uh, hi, Dr. Korzani. Hope you're doing well. Uh, hi, Carl. How are you? Yes, doing good. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, let's just say a quick hello to uh, everyone in the, stream, in the uh, chat. So uh, hi Charlene, hi Cross, hi Lisa, and hi Lawrence. So uh, Dr. Karazani, uh, introducing you is uh, kind of a problem for me because you do so many different things. So um, I'll just say that uh, Dr. Karazani is uh, a dear friend and teacher and mentor and uh, I will ask him to uh, introduce himself to our viewers. Uh, thank you very much, Carl. I'm going to start. Before I start, I want to ask you, is it normal that I don't see you? Uh, are you not getting my, uh, my disp Oh, sorry, my bad. <laughs> you should see me, uh, you should see me now. Yeah. yeah, I can see you now, right? All right. That's right. Okay. Sorry about it. <laughs> No problem. Yes, I uh, I am uh, I'm arms and armor researcher, and I have worked uh, for different museums uh, in Iran, in Europe, United States, everywhere. Also with Russian colleagues, with Ukrainian colleagues, different museums, private collections, and uh, I also have written eight books, published many articles, print articles, and most of them in academic and peer-reviewed journals. I think I published more than 189 different articles about me as a researcher and also an arms and armor uh, specialist. That's what I do. So could you tell us how you got started in uh, arms and armor research? Because I know you were introduced to martial arts from a very young age, but actual research yeah. is a very different part. Yes, um, yeah, of course, research is a very different thing. Uh, regarding research, I mean, uh, many people know me or my publications are published, for example, in archaeology journals, uh, uh, famed archaeology journals like Shedet, right, or many others are also published a lot in, in engineering journals like in New York, University of New York Engineering, which was an encyclopedia, metallurgy engineering. I published also a lot in military history journals, which are really academic. Also, my articles are mostly academic, but also published in military journals, military history journals, art journals, and things like that. So the start for me uh, was before I did all these things, I'm a uh, trained academic. I studied in the United States, I studied in Germany, and I studied also in Spain in all three relevant languages. So because I speak and write, not only speak, I write academically in these three languages. And because I'm a to thank my supervisor, especially for my PhD, I, was, I had always very good professors who encouraged me to write. It's not easy. So I was already equipped with that in the area I studied. Areas I studied are PhD in English, so uh, specifically American English and American history in English. That's why I'm very PhD in English. And I also have a master's degree in, 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 of course, in English and um, Spanish, and that's why my interest in Spain, Spanish and Spain, and I'm, because of also South and Middle America, next to Portuguese, uh, Span or at first comes Spanish and then Portuguese because of uh, Brazil. And I'm also, I studied business administration, um, specifically leadership studies and organizational science and leadership. So these are my background. Now, why am um, why interested in uh, military science or in weapons? Yes, as I said, I grew up, so I was already equipped from academic side. As once you are trained in an academic field, you can transfer it into other academic field, provided you have um, an interest or access. Access is also important and power to do that. And I grew up in martial arts as a kid, as a very small kid, different martial arts, wrestling, uh, karate, kung fu, Later on, BJJ and also Japanese swordsmanship. Name it. You know, I, uh, I, uh, I'm into uh, was into different martial arts. Then I realized, and of course, Japanese uh, swords. I still love it next to Persian, 
sort I'm a big admirer of Japanese steel, Nihonto. Many people don't know or have not handled real Japanese blades. There is a treat to see Japanese blades. It's like is a human feat to forge such magnificent swords. But then later on, I realized my ancestors, as far as my background or my ethnic background is concerned, Persian, Iranian, that they were also masterful skills. They had masterful skills in making and forging swords, right? And then I realized back then that, um, well, in auction houses, I started to follow and I realized that the most expensive swords were Japanese and Persian, right? <laughs> so then I said, if there is something so expensive, there is a reason behind it. You know, I know many people don't like, oh, it's like an art trend. And later on, I can say the quality of steel of these two are really exceptional and um, for different reasons. And uh, But then I started to do more research and it started with swords. In the beginning, I was always a sword guy, forging processes, how pattern, um, crucible steel, the so-called Pulade Gohardor or the Fulade Johardor or the so-called Damascus steel was made in crucibles. And uh, back then I started to do that. And I also realized uh, when I wrote the, my first book, Arms and Armor from Iran, I was the first guy who, after years and years, I was not in Iran, many years. I went back and then I realized they have um, three museums. Mm -hmm. museums, uh, museum, military museum of Tehran, Shiraz, and Bandar and Zali, and both of them showed showed um, or have a collection of Iranian kings from Nasiruddin Shah Qajar. Then I thought, okay, publications which I knew on English back then. I back then I did not have access to Russian or other things in English or in German or whatever or French and so on, mostly in English are based always on museum collections of Europe and United States. So then you see that to some extent a bit Russia, then there isn't something off. You are completely missing the collections in Iran. So that's why I started to work with Iran and they opened these museums for me. And after years of study, my book, uh, Arms and Armor from Iran, that really huge book was published in 2006. Yeah, I have it just over here. Uh, it is a big book. <laughs> Yes, this is the book, right. And this was, uh, if I remember correctly, it was nine, ten years of work, if I remember correctly. Yeah, a lot of work, yes. Years of work, because in the making, also, I cross-reference many things, back then things which were available. And back then, of course, by now, right, I have also wrote, written lots of articles on my manuscripts on making crucible steel, also on archery manuscripts, which I wrote. You know, let me just it's, it's mention the state of that book back then. Steel is leading, steel is selling very well to museums, private collectors, and many private people. But let, because it shows um, over, a, over 500 items in Iranian museums and all measurements are there. And you, can, you cannot just gain access to a museum like that. But one thing which is for us very important or for me was very important back then, it is based as far as back then I could find secondary publications uh, like in Persian on these uh, materials, which is essential and everything else which was published in the West. Back then, just to give an example, everyone knew about uh, Mustafa Khani, the, all the Ottoman uh, manuscript on archery, right? But no one almost knew about Persian ones. By now, by now I have published more than or uh, translated eight eight uh, complete manuscripts of archery, nine, excuse me, and published them, right, nine. I mean, complete archery, Persian archery manuscripts. And together with B. Dwyer, uh, our team member, we published and annotated, not only published, put them into practice. So it's a revolutionary change. For example, if you have Mustafa Khan in Ottoman archery, and I'm sure we have more in Turkish, but in Persia, I have offered the word eight to nine. The same is about crucible steel making. Please take a look at that. I was the first guy, in, who wrote in English about Chahak and I represented that. Later on, it was picked up by two former students of mine, presented um, somewhere else. But I was the first guy, guy and I found out Chahak is actually Chahak is Chahak, which was a center of patterned crucible steel making in Iran. Before I did it, uh, Dr. Feuerbach and Feuerbach found out that in Uzbekistan, there were also center of crucible steel making. Why am I saying it? Because it is true that crucible steel was mostly made in India, let's say mostly in South India, also to some extent in middle north, and they were heavily traded, 
right, and brought into Iran. Back then, they said that people who brought them the Persian Smiths, they made the best place. It is evident because Russians wanted to have it, Dayton Polish wanted to have it, or Europeans, then Ottomans wanted to have it, then Arabs wanted to have it, even Indian, Mughal Indians wanted to have it. But the crucible the cake came from India. Everyone was saying it until through the manuscripts, I found it's not true. And then one of my former students went and found out that Chahak indeed, there, there, are, there were archaeological excavations. And they didn't even need to excavate Khan. There were oh. ha- ruins where you could find crucibles there. Right? L- literally then, just walking around and you find the... Yeah, oh, right. yeah. Yeah, yeah. There were just ruins. And then if, you, if you, they did it that way, just put the earth a bit, and then you could find. So, you know, for me, it was a continuous quest. You know, it is not, you know, the Razmafsar project for me, Let's put it that way, fighting as I'm a martial artist, not don't forget about all these swords and things, is only one aspect of it. I'm into metallurgy. I'm into finding all these things. And I'm interested also in bigger picture what I'm doing at the moment. Strategy, military strategy. I'm right, translating books on military strategy, like we have it in Sun, by Sun Tzu or many others. Where do I have it here? Maybe, for example, maybe I can show it to you here. For example, you know, and I, it's a book not written by me, but <laughs> the seven military classes of ancient China. You mm-hmm. see, these are about many different Chinese texts on military strategy and strategy. We all, everyone talks about Sun Tzu. Sun Tzu is only one. We have so many more. And also in Japanese, we have it, like Miyamoto Musashi Book of Five Rings or Hakakura and many others. But so we have in uh, Persian. Because why? Because I and I'm not the only one who says that, but because like culture of a country, we are all products as I teach at the university. If you want, I can also go into that way. Uh, we are, I'll teach my students that way at the university. We are all products of a culture we live in, okay. right? And we respond to that culture. You can be counterculture. For example, Italians are like that. Iranians are like that. Germans are like that. It's all nonsense. But we can say the German system, its tactics of inclusion and exclusion, exclusion is like that. So if I, as a German citizen, respond to that, this country is going to promote me. If I don't mm-hmm. respond, try to play counter or revolutionary, the system will punish me, just very simplified. But important is so we have a military culture which develops over centuries and goes ahead and ahead. So if you want to analyze the military of a country, how they move, go back to the history and you will find a pattern. That's what I'm doing at the moment with um, Persian text. So a country is, has not only a national culture, but it has a military culture. So what I said to me, you know, I'm, I'm interested in battlefields to some extent also about the, you know, okay, these so-called, so-called, I don't even like the word fencing. I don't want to step on anyone's toes, but let's call it swordsmanship or fight with a weapon, with a sword, right? I'm not that much interested in individual feet and this and that. I'm a martial artist, but in a military science, you're interested in systems. A system fights against another system. Not that some ego-driven person, I did this and I did that. Individuals never count in military science. Only the system <laughs> systems count. Yeah, it's so for that, <laughs> You understand? <laughs> so it is not like that. So and I'm, I'm into that. So, you know, it's, let's put it that way. Equipped with what I was trained in three systems, applying it now to different... and being a martial artist, going that way, starting from artifacts, analyzing the artifacts from a metallurgical point of view, from how they were made, how they were decorated, like gold inlaying, whatever, Mm -hmm. finding sources for secondary sources in Iran, also international, then original sources, primary sources going into that, then how these artifacts were made, how these artifacts were used, which was also my book on Persian archery and swordsmanship, and then so on and so on. And then later on, military strategy, how the co- military culture is there. So basically, and uh, I'm interested in different military cultures and then to find out, because, you know, put it that way, you know, for example, let us let me just, because you mentioned about that, um, as you know, I'm very interested in uh, Guanches or the original Canarians, right, who yeah. came from North Africa. For example, we know that in Tenerife, they defeated the Spanish army, right? 
But if you go twice, I think if I don't, I'm not saying, I mean, I went to that valley when I was in Tenerife, I tried to find a trail they found. But you need to think about it. They were using Spanish seal and guanches, brave man. They're, as we know it, Amazigh from North Africa originally immigrated there. Brave man, but they had stone age technology. But how did they fight? They fought in a system, in a cohesive system, Again, Spanish who were also very cohesive system with very good soldiers. Then my question is, which, which comes up, you see, it's not always the weapon which wins. It's the system and coordination of the system which determines the outcome of a battlefield, right? And for that, and I'm very interested in that. Spe specifically, you know that I'm also very interested in Mesoamerica, oh, how yeah. Aztecs yeah, face it. I mean, I'm, uh, my thoughts is, start, I'm very fascinated by Spanish history, but when I'm fascinated by Spanish history, I need to know who faced the Spaniards. Right? Absolutely, so, yes. <laughs> you know, that's why I'm interested in Philippine history. I'm interested in Mesoamerica. I'm interested in Canary Islands, because I just want to know how, who faced the Spanish soldier or army or whatever, and how. So I just go and tra trace out the same I do it with the United States, of course. You know that I'm very fascinated by training and also personal life in American history, Amer Native Americans, whom they faced the early uh, settlers in the United States and so on and so on. And well, the same in Germany, you know, as you know, that I did do also lots of research on German military history and army. So that's what I do, right? I, I just try then to expand from the side where I'm trained in the countries and then who these countries face in their you know, military encounter worldwide, what kind of weapons. And this is then if you go like that, because I'm interested in culture, as you know, I started for Iran Bronze Age to the end of the Qajar period, which is the 19th century. But once you have such an approach, you can always go and analyze the technology. You can always analyze the martial arts. You can go into uh, doing that and just go ahead. That's what I have done. And that's the uh, result that I have been doing, actually. That's what I do. <laughs> and you do have a very... Uh, uh, deep, it's, a boat, uh, it's both deep and broad in terms of understanding the, uh, the material, because uh, apart from the uh, artifacts and the weapons, then you also have the uh, translation of the uh, Book of Jewels, which you, uh, which you published in. And that also yeah. goes a lot into uh, the materials themselves. Maybe before we go to Book of Jewels, may I just mention something, Carl, which is very of interesting, course. possibly. Uh, one of my, no, not one of my, my next upcoming book, which I cannot just say the title now because it's already edited, it's going, is a page setting. And for some reasons, as you know, uh, I'm not going to mention it. It's, it deals with um, Indian weapons from India, right? right? but based on Persian manuscripts. So I think many people might be interested in that. And um, in that, when you read, you read Mughal India. I mean, Mughal Indians were who were sat settled in North of India. And then I was reading about that. Okay, Mughal Indian brought in Central Asian fighting methods. They were also very, very fascinated by Safavid Iran culturally, you know, many areas, not only North, but other areas spoke Persian in India but not in the South and not where the Mah Mah Maharatas and the others were Rajputs. Some of Rajputs were allies with them. Some of them were not, but anyhow, some Rajputs were not allies, very brave man. But for example, when you read, I was reading it and then I read, first of all, from um, Mughal Indian sites in Persian, how they faced the Rajputs or other way around. Rajputs, for example, had a tradition when they saw that they had no way to win. So they had all these saffron color they just uh, made yellow everything and half naked with swords and things went to face the, and the enemy, which were the, in this case, the Mughal Indians. Not, I'm not talking about Rajputs who were allies uh, of Mughal India, they, they were ones who were facing them. And Marat has did it as, as well, to be saffron, yellow. But let's stick to Rajputs. And then they fought to the last man and died. And when I was reading regarding the culture, the Mughal Indians were saying, Rajputs are very brave man. They know how. Uh, they know how to die, but not necessarily how to fight. Oh. Because a good fighter needs to retreat as well. So without judging it, when you read that, Rajputs looked at it as the ultimate sign of bravery, like Japanese. Hmm? Japanese. What do Japanese Bushido, what does it tell us? And I grew up with Bushido. 
a man should not get old but die in battle, at least in theory, right? You see that Rajputs share that, but yeah. Mughal Indians didn't share. And now, if you go and say, of course not everyone can follow that, because we all want to preserve our lives. You know, there is one thing that I come and read from a military history book, or something written, we never know in history, is it like an exaggeration or a fact? And I'm not talking about China, sorry. It could be, <laughs> sorry, it could be something Persian or whatever. Sorry, I just didn't want to, I just picked it up. Right. Um, it could be Persian, Iranian, right? And we have enough exaggerations in Iranian military history as well. I mean, come on. And the whole idea is for us is the following is if I go, right? And then um, sometimes you don't want to die because there is a voice inside all of us to not to die, to preserve life, and which is good. <clears throat> it's not bad. But, but at the same time, so if the system, as again, back to system, culture and system, predominantly the members want to die. So they have a, another concept of martyrdom and they want to die, they want to be martyrs and the others want to go and retreat, fight back and take as many out as possible. You see, you have two different concepts. You have two different concepts. For example, uh, no, it's, uh, if I don't want to go into modern warfare, but maybe I can give an example in modern for, for warfare. For example, um, in the Iran-Iraq war, Iranians called this war a holy war, right? Because holy that, that where they went to fight, they said, this is because you sacrifice your life for the country. So it's a holy, the place is holy, not holy in this case that we read in all oh, these things, right? Because, and then there is an area you pray because this could be your last day. You see, it goes hand in hand like with Rajputs, it goes hand in hand like in the uh, Bushido or Samurai and these things. Now. If I come and then I have, a, I have a version of a mercenary approach, I'm not saying it's good or bad, it's a different approach to fighting, right? And so then when you come and look at the, and these are for a military historian, in my humble opinion, are as important as analyzing the forging technique of a weapon, as analyzing how was this weapon decorated, or how some, um, you know, a book on fencing, like, I'll come back to fencing. A swordsman, she was written how to do these things. Because most of these books are there to somehow um, push for the ego of the writer. Yeah, but I'm not interested. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, but I'm not interested in that as a military history. I, I'm interested in that only in the written, the context it is written for. I'm interested in analyzing the systems and how these systems use human beings and tools. I think we talked about this car once. Chinggis Khan, one of the first things to make Mongol army efficient was the de complete destruction of ego. If someone left the rank and tried to make some heroic deeds, he was killed by the Mongols because they wanted to say, we are all together, not individual feats. You see, if you have such a system which does not even salute you, promote your heroic deeds, you see the difference. But when you come back to Persia in Iranian history, being a hero based on Rostam, based on Shah Nameh is extremely important. You see, you know? So when you come and look at this, and these are, in my opinion, as important as analyzing the weapon. I think my, 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 my suggestion for young researchers would be, do not concentrate on the weapon only, right? Because weapon is only a tool. There is also a man behind the weapon, but not only the man behind the weapon, there's the, more importantly, the system behind the man. Of course. Right? Otherwise, everything is just, in my humble opinion, a futile attempt. Of course, you don't have time to do all these things to, uh, on your own. That's why, you know, I, you know that I cooperate with many researchers. We have lots of cooperation, lots of things together, of course. But then to get the, to get the big picture, Otherwise, you're going to have an isolated picture. And if you analyze only rapiers, then you believe rapiers are the best. Or if you do shamshirs, shamshirs are the best. Or katanas are the best. As we all know, this is like a kiddies talk, right? Excuse me, how you use this word kiddies talk. But you know what I mean? Otherwise, it's just a futile attempt just to you know, push for my own preferences. This is, in my humble opinion, a wrong approach. That's what I, I, I do. You know, many people say, why do you write these different books and different articles? Because I want, for Iran at least, 
to gain uh, or uh, to gain the big picture. And of course, not only Iran, I also do it as I said for other countries. These three countries, um, my time is limited, and uh, this will be first of all, as you said. Spain, United States, Germany, but also back there, India, I did it because those manuscripts were in Persian. So there's are an analysis from Persian speaking Indians, right? Mostly Mughal India and some other areas where they wrote those manuscripts in Persian, right? So that's, um, that's what uh, I do, right? Okay. Uh, the thing is that uh, in the uh, modern day, I think most people get exposed to uh, uh, historical weapons and armor only through uh, media, be it video games, books, uh, television, and so on. So I think they do get that kind of, uh, okay, the heroic uh, tunnel vision kind of thing, yeah? Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 mean I, don't, uh, I, don't, I don't remember, sadly, his name. It was an American commander, I think, he, I forgot his name. He was responsible for the fight in, uh, when he, they came to Germany. Now, I don't know his units from where he came to Germany, but I know that um, he and German army uh, fought in Remagen. There was a bridge in Remagen, and I was there a couple of times. And uh, very brave units from Americans and very brave units from German side, they all fought and whatever. And at the end, the famous statement by him, I think it's written when you go to that bridge, who's where he wrote, there is no heroism in war, and there is no glory in war. Because it was so nasty, that's what he said it. He hated that. He said, there is no glory if, I don't rem if my memory doesn't fail me and there is no heroism in war. So I don't believe, I don't believe, you know, one of the worst things, you know, that's why you know, I had not, you have some two new members and they always, uh, you know, contact me, they're new. Oh, what about that? I feel like this. I said, no, 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 no. If you want to feel that way and hero, it's not, Rasmus is not a place for you. You are here doing, you know, <laughs> six facts and you're going to do research. There is no place for heroism. And at the end of the day, I wrote a lot. You know that I, most of my research, I also write about leadership, as you know, uh, so about intercultural management. Not a lot. Most of this is about weapon days, the historical weapon. But if some people ask me, oh, this is such a high art. Yeah, it's the highest level of technology was always spent on weapon and weaponry. If you go to Bronze Age, China, Iran, high civilizations, the best bronze items were cast from the best bronze for weapons. Because if I had something to be beautiful or nice or drink, it didn't need to be a best technology to withstand the blow. So they, I mean, they always had that. And then when the iron technology the same, and it was worldwide, steel technology is the same. Today is no different. So it's basically if it's something that uh, your life is going to depend on, then make sure it's the absolutely the best uh, yes. possible. But mixing it up, in my humble opinion, and saying, oh, this is a high art and this and that. No, this is military science. You should call a spade a spade. You like it or hate it. This is military science. In my humble opinion, of course, I love beautiful Persian blades. I love beautiful Nihonto Japanese blades or beautiful Chinese with pattern weld. I love them. They're art, I know. But at the end of the day, they're weapons. And, you know, we need to take this into consideration. If someone, you're not writing a piece of literature, you're not into literary studies, you're not painting Salvador Dali, you're not uh, composing Beethoven or imitating a new <laughs> work like Beethoven. I'm not saying they're bad, but they are just at the end of the day, we should not lose the perspective. These were weapons, you know, or also, you know, I handled many museum pieces, you know, oh, this is a ceremonial weapon. But interestingly, ceremonial weapons, also that German sword, remember, we replicated. We had a discussion about it, yeah. Yeah, you know, the best blade, it had the best blade. Of course, if you have a coronation sword, you are not going to have a bad blade on that, <laughs> right? <laughs> Germany. And the same was in Iran. So calling it a ceremonial sword is misleading because people think, oh, it never works in a real fight. Okay. Well, it works. It's expensive. Maybe we should call it only a coronation sword. Maybe we should call it, I don't know, right? But ceremonial, because people always think, oh, so it's a flimsy, you know? Okay. Just may, uh, doctor, may I bring up an example of the uh, uh, a bronze mace, if I remember correctly? Yeah. 
So this one has a very unusual design. Yes, this is an excavated item, which is in, excuse me, in my first book, Arms and Armor from Iran. This was um, excavated in Marlik, north of Iran. Mm -hmm. by a professor, it's thousands of years. I mean, it's a professor, uh, Negahban, late professor Negahban, one of the best archaeologists, actually, he was in the world. And I excavated that. If you take a look at that, you see that there are human heads with eyes. Do you see nose, eyes, and also mouth? You can see that, right? Yeah, I don't know yeah. if, if, if my mouse does my mouse sh show it now. I don't know. Uh, I, I don't think it does, no, but no, it uh, I, I think they're clearly yeah. visible. You know, sometimes I mean, you know, one face is this way with the chin this way, the other mm -hmm. one is that way. You see, so I mean, it's the Mesa. So now the question is, is it still sturdy enough? Yes, and the question is. Is it ceremonial or not? I had this, you know, this discussion with an archaeologist who was insist, who insisted back then, this is ceremonial. And I said, okay, I'm going to shaft it and then hit you on the hand. And you find out <laughs> it's ceremonial or not. And he didn't want to be hit with that. Because, I mean, come on. <laughs> you know, because those humans, they're cast in one piece and they're as sturdy as, imagine you have a knobbed mace. You know what I mean, car. Yes, but yes. these knobs <clears throat> are in the shape of a human face so and the question is it from the casting technology just to make this cire perdu as the french say right was wax method it mm -hmm. is very time consuming to make these casts right of course yeah, it i can clear. imagine it is clear and many times casts fail it's casting right <laughs> come on you know what casting is slightest thing in your cast the bronze you, you is going to have a crack we know that but calling it ceremonial is misleading. We could, you know, because people always associate something in our circles with a ceremonial, you know what I mean? Like a wall hanger. No you know functional, I mean? yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, functional or wall hanger, as they called the some swords in the <laughs> early time. Then we started talking about swords 20, 25 years ago. Yeah, so this is this, yeah. So, uh, which, which period would uh, would this be from? How uh, how old was this? Oh, this piece goes like uh, one thousand BC. You know, goes really back. Yes, yes, it is. Or more than one thousand BC, but uh, it's definitely around that area. More like civilizations. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That, that's one of the that's one of the things that really fascinates me about uh, uh, Persian uh, metallurgy and. Uh, uh, metal crafting because uh, it it goes back so so long ago. Yes, it is. Um, it is really uh, uh, unbelievable how how far it goes back, right? So we're, talk yes, we're talking approximately uh, two thousand five hundred BC, if I remember correctly. Yes, yes. This is like you know, let's say one thousand. And to be on a safe side, right? Okay. Is more than three thousand years in general. Old um, uh, sites were in Marlik, which was in north of Iran, which is, excuse me, north of Iran. Yes. All right. And if we take an example, I believe this is a sword handle from the same period. Yes, it's uh, it's exactly. It's goes. It's from Luristan. So now, if you Luristan, you go to north. Excuse me, to southeast. No, southwest, sorry, southeast. I'm just <laughs> calculating the wrong way. Iran is here, south, yes, west. If you go down there, this is an iron mask sword. I mean, this is the blade is broken, but mm -hmm. on top of it, you see there are two masks. And normally on top of the pommel, there are two bearded men. And then you can see the face, facial feature. And then down there, there are two lines. Okay, it's the corroded, you don't see. These iron mask swords are very delicate. They were made let's say different pieces, but 12 to 16 pieces made of iron separately, then they are put together uh, again. That, that's, a, that's a lot of work for a weapon, and given the time period, I don't think someone would just throw that together just to hang on the wall, definitely. Actually, you know, we had this discussion, uh, just it's an iron sword, um, they cast in different pieces and put together. Anyone who claims to be good at metallurgy, please try to imitate one. <laughs> 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 and they didn't do it with modern technology, right? Yeah, of course, absolutely. I mean, 
do you ask me? It's not only in Iran, right? You know, just because that's that's way before one gets nationalistic, right? Okay, Iran has a very long metallurgical history. That's not for that's for sure. But let's say on a human level, let's say China, China and Iran are very old civilizations, both of them, and both of them offer really wonderful things and very old things. But let's uh, just face this and mention that when you uh, treat these things, it really humbles you. It humbles you because you realize with all these new technology, we are not capable of making many things our ancestors used to make. And this, this really humbles you, you know, and then I, I really need to, you know, because before, sadly, I need to mention that in some circles, people have no clue about Nihonto, let's go back to Japanese Nihonto. And although Japanese with some short breaks after the Second World War, where production was at least not allowed, but then they allowed it after not so long after that, and they kept the tradition of sword making, which we have in Japan now, um, thanks heaven, but still Japanese Smith will tell you, and that's what I love about Japanese mentality, that we cannot produce many blades, or some blades at least, I stand corrected, where our ancestors used to make those patterns they are not capable. Or polishers, you know, you need five years to be really good to be a smith and five years to be a polisher, or two different crafts. And they tell you, so they are humbled, right? So that's five and, years uh, of practice just to just to learn how to polish, specifically how to well, polish. Well, five years how to forge. And it is not that they keep you. If you're not good, they let you go, for example, right? All right. So you need to have also the talent. It's not that you just sit, you know, okay, at the university, let's put it that way. If you are talented, you get really good grades. If you're not talented, you still can pass. You have an average grade. You see what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get you. But they don't let you go. You understand what I mean, right? <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're in a rich university, which they say only A's and B plus, otherwise anyone else goes. <laughs> it makes it, you know, but very few universities are like that. You know that, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, going forward, let's see. I, I believe uh, this is the uh, Akenakis that was on the cover of uh, of your book, Arms and Armor from Iran. Yeah. And oh, yeah, this, this is a magnificent piece. Yeah, this is. I mean. This is from a Kemenid period, and this is in my book. I mean, I, let me just say, you know, <laughs> when I teach at university, I teach, um, I teach in a, a two leading universities here in Germany, in Frankfurt. And one of the things I always share, not always, sometimes share with my students is the following. We have ethical leadership, which is not <laughs> like today, Carl, but what I teach, and we have intercultural leadership and cross-cultural leadership, actually. There are two fields I teach. And I can also do and compare lots from military, but one of the things, military studies from cultural point of view. But one thing which is interesting for me or for my students is always ask them from ethical point of view, does everyone has his or her price? And if yes or no, how much is it? You know, as I know very American, I know it's very American. Someone has like 500,000, 1 million, 2 million, 3 million. And one, especially in investment banking, let's just ex exaggerate and classify and categorize. Everyone has this price. But when people ask me, what is one of the best moments in your life? And it thinks, I said, holding this sword, because I, all these pieces you see in my books, I had them in my hand and measured them by hand myself. Okay, of course, we have gloves to protect. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> One of the best things um, which I handled in my life was that I handled this sword in my hand and measured it. I think that moment is a, was a priceless moment or is, let's put use present simple, is a priceless moment. And with no words I can describe how it feels to have historical swords belonging to some kings or whatever in your hand. Is Akenake or Akenake is, is made of gold is solid, is uh, approximately, let's say, 800 grams, if you want to put the gram. It has on the pommel two lions, delicate features. You can see the tongue, you can see the... Yeah, it's, it's very finely crafted. Yes, very finely crafted. Eyes, and then you have also other animals uh, 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 on the quillion, right? I think they are like mm, goats, yeah. if I... 
or some some people say they're mis you know he, you know some mis, you know mystery or whatever it is but they're animals anyhow if they're goats or not or whatever okay. uh, Lisa is asking is that solid gold solid gold yes oh. Solid gold is, uh, is the, the way, okay, I mean, the question is solid, I mean, it's not 100% gold, because if it's 100% gold, you can bend it, of course, you can just do it like this. Every gold, as we know, because of carrots, right, we have some uh, copper um, uh, mixed with it, and this is the case here as well, is the solid gold, yes. And from this, we have um, Bakhtin, Bakhtin, um, one is in uh, Iran, one is in Iran, Bit of completed. One is in Metropolitan Museum of Art, almost like this, but this one is nicer. And really, it's nicer, not because this one is in, <laughs> in, in Iran, it's is nicer than the one, both of Persian, right? Because the one in a, in a Metropolitan Museum of Art, I believe, is cut into two because there was a guy, a farmer, um, and he, on his tractor or one agricultural machine, I don't remember which one, I'm not very good at these things, and he was just ploughing the land, and all of a sudden he hears a click, right? And actually he was oh. in an article site, he didn't know that, <laughs> excuse me, I'm laughing. And then he cut that kingly sword, a royal sword into two. Oh. Uh, and then it was later, I don't know, it went to New York, and I don't want to go into that road, <laughs> right? <laughs> But uh, but uh, it's there, yeah, and the one is here. But back then, I I I I was told that there is one more, one more of them, which is in a private collection in the United States of America. They told me, All right. London, but mostly the United States. So I tried to trace it, but uh, I also worked with leading private collectors worldwide, leading really with. Um, with the Ukrainian private collectors, Russian, one Russian, um, French, um, Italian, American, and British, so or Polish, right? Um, working with different, or Hungarian, right? Working with private collectors is very, very good because you need to just, they need to trust you, right? I'm an academic. I'm not an investor to have access. Either museums work with me or private collectors work with me. So because they have money, right? And uh, I tried to establish contact, but through every, every, many venues, museums and so, but no one could. But fortunately this year, if you go to my channel, you will see, see it, Museum of Getty, Getty Museum in Los Angeles, they exhibited a uh, beautiful, beautiful exhibition in Achaemenian art. They collected from all around the world and there you find the golden Akinakis. And that's the thing I was looking for. Right? <laughs> Yeah, and I interviewed Professor Dayoi, Professor Dr. Dayoi, my colleague in the University of California, Irvine, on that. And this is now the third one, which is now in museum. I don't know, I think it's still an exhibition. If you go to Los Angeles Getty Museum, that's the third one. But the third one is very beautiful because it has a scabbard made of uh, beautiful gold. You go to my channel, I analyzed one I did in Persian, one I did in English. You can see it completely, I analyzed it. It has a beautiful chased golden scabbard, solid gold. It has this uh, solid golden handle, but it had used to have an uh, iron blade and part of iron blade you see there. All right. But this is the third one. Yes. But this one, like the Metropolitan Museum of Art, both of them lack scabbard. I'm sure they both had golden scabbards, but we don't know where it is. And both of them are cast in one solid piece of gold, including the, the, the blade. So, I have two questions about this. So, uh, the uh, handle we saw previously, when it was complete and uh, with the blade and everything, would it have been uh, somewhere like this shape? You mean this one? Uh, the, the one we saw previously. Um, oh, you mean the iron one? Yeah, yeah. Oh. Or okay, would it I have can... been a different shape entirely? Um, you know, um, let me just mention something. If I can find something, I can explain it. Let me just see. Mm, where is it? Is it here? Just a second, please, Car. Yeah, no if I find it here. Oh, yeah. Let me see if I can share it. If not, yes. Can you see that? One second. Uh, let, let, me, uh, let me correct the screen. I can think, you see the picture? Uh, yeah, we can see the picture. I just need to adjust the, uh, the screen. Ooh, that I looks... need to have the whole picture, if possible. Coming up. 
for a while. Okay. Yes. Perfect. That's it. You see here, you see, let me just talk about the bronze technology and I come back to that iron sword. Okay, okay. Carl? Yeah, and definitely. This is from a very important collection. Again, I made also a video on that in English in, in Frankfurt, right? In Frankfurt, which is on uh, bronze weapons from Luristan and also Northern Iran. Please take a look. I don't know if I can, you can see my mouse here. You can, you can see it, yes. Okay, you see that this is the earliest technology. The earliest technology of bronze swords is made like this, different shapes, but you see that the tank is cast together with the blade, mm -hmm. right? So they cast it, then they call it open cast. Again, open cast. So in this open cast, it's like that. Then you are going to have a handle. This handle was mainly um, made of, let's say, bone, wood, or many things. And most of them are gone, decayed, right? So it's like that. Later on, they found out that bronze is a very good material. You know, we, you know my colleagues did some uh, cutting tests with that. And I'm going to do it as well so people see bronze is no joke because people think, oh, bronze is bronze can cut very well. But the problem of bronze is not only that, okay, there are two problems. It's not that, oh, it breaks. It's not true. Or it bends that fast. It's not true if it's well made. The problem of uh, bronze, in my humble opinion, are two things. The first thing, okay, it does not, the edge retention, right, is not as good as you can find, of course, in steel. That's why the bronze with fighters had always, always a sharpener, right? Um, it's also in this museum. If you want, I can show it this sharpener, what they look like. And the second thing they had, bronze, you need to make sure that you cut always in the right angle. If you hit with the flat, right, in a okay. right angle, it can bend at the tank. You see that the tank here? Yes. Right. And you know, and we know it as swordsman or as martial artist. Carl, you know that. Oh, you need to have the rear edge alignment in the heat of the battle. You know, I learned like you need to punch like that, like in box, punch like this. But I mean, come on, sometimes you don't punch it as you were learned in the classical case because you're <laughs> fighting for your life. You understand? I mean, whatever. You, you don't even need the uh, heat of battle because if you're sp even if you're just sparring uh, in a friendly match and you're tired and it's hot and. Uh, yeah. I, at, at some point you just panic and <laughs> yes exactly like okay hold it you know like in professional boxing hold it at this angle when you do a hook okay sometimes uh, you know amateurs do like that but not something in between but people just do it because and then they uh, hurt their hand right I mean these things happen you know <laughs> come on and so this was then this one right as you can see it here so they could cut it and then later on they developed this technology this cast on method this one, it has a broken blade. So they had this tank, this one, the first cast, and they put it in the second cast, and they cast on the grip on that. You see that? Okay. So this is the development. These two are development to this. And then if you want to know, they filled it in like this one. It looks like it's la later Ottoman Yatajan, right? Okay. You see that? You know, you can put this here. Or you, can, you know, it's very pronounced. Or you see that in that. You see that here. Yeah. But later on, they realized, okay, it, it, it's, it's made of ivory, bone, or different materials. And if it gets hit, okay, it can break off. So they figured out it's maybe better to have this nice part. Instead of this, we cast everything in bronze. You see that? Like, yeah, okay. Right? So it became the latest technology in the bronze, right? So now I just get out of that. Just let me see if it works, hopefully. Okay. It works, right, Carl? Yes. So if you come back with your... Uh, Iron Mask Sword. Okay, uh, the, the Iron Mask Sword or this one? No, it doesn't matter. All right. You see that they follow the same thing. Yeah, they follow the same thing. So they cast uh, the uh, the blade, then on top of it. But it's the, if the handle is very complicated, like this one, that is lost wax method, or as mm -hmm. cire perdu, as the French say. So they shape it, and then with the, and then wax, and then they pour molten uh, bronze or gold in it and then it melts the wax and then it shapes the way you want it so that's what it is the way it's done amazing yeah i mean really amazing i i i mean when i started to write uh, my book and so and so okay, i wish i could convince one day one of these rich collectors to have one of these reproductions made of uh, this uh, sword, made of gold, right? Not made of bronze. <laughs> but the problem is, 
the material cost is uh, really prohibitive. Right? Yeah, I mean, like you said, 800 grams of gold isn't <laughs> isn't exactly cheap. Plus, I don't think the uh, do we even have the uh, technique still to uh, to do this? Because I know with some things like crucible steel, uh, that's uh, that ship has sailed already. I mean, to get the, the, the real shape of it, okay, this is gold is easier to make, right? Gold, let's put it that way, because it can shape it much easier. It's not like crucible seal. Um, gold is one of the most, uh, let's put it that way, uh, or no, the best, one of the best metals because it can shape it much better. But uh, the question is not how, if we just have something in gold and shape it, it's a cast method, casting method. That's the difference, you see what I mean? It's yeah, I get you, I get you. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's the difference, right? Oh, I can now just come and shape it. Oh, it's not the question of shaping, you need to cast it, right? Yeah. So, uh, another question about this. Is this, uh, is this usable as a weapon? Was this usable as a weapon? Uh, you know, okay, let's put it that way. If you go to, to if you go to, um, let me just go to, uh, bronze and i come back to that okay now that the earliest technology we had there, as far as metal is concerned right was copper mm -hmm. later on copper they found we have copper weapons also in iran but iranian at a very early age added 10 added 10 or arsenic or a combination of two to the copper and uh, it's very interesting it's like you add you add later on carbon to iron to become steel so they did the same concept and also in, in in China, we know that the edges have a higher higher level of um, tin or arsenic mm -hmm. compared to the body. So you see that. So this is already the start of valid steel or sandwich sandwich plates. Okay. And, but uh, it doesn't matter if they have the sandwich uh, cast on methods. So the edges have higher level of tin or arsenic, as is the case in China. If you come back and take a look at um, I mean, all bronze weapons I handle, they have case hardened edges. Case hardened is that uh, when they take it out, they hammer the edges very, very much. And the more you ha hammer that, the more it gets, you know, dense and it's case hardening. And you will be very interesting that, interested in that, that, okay, gold, you cannot case harden, right? Because, you know, Gold had a bit of copper in it, so you can hold it, right? So these things, I mean, let's put it that way. Did they use this in fighting because it's pure gold? Of course not, right? The, what the question would it be? Would it hold against an armor? Against armor, of course not. But the question is what holds against an armor, right? But that's the second question. But if someone is wearing a shirt, right, can you hurt him with this thing? Of uh, course, I would can. imagine so. Yeah. <laughs> of course, you can. If someone is wearing like in a like in a courtroom some nice silk material or okay, they say silk <laughs> holds the arrow. Yeah, of course. And you just go and trust the guy with that. I mean, come on. At the end of the day, your body against metal. <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. You know. Okay. Uh... Cross is asking, may we see an image of the sharpener? Uh, the uh, I believe that's one for yes. yes, yes. Let me just find it, of course. Hopefully, I have it here. This sharpener for bronze, right? That's right, yeah. Uh, I wish I had here. If not, let me see. I will try to find it. <laughs> a sharpener. Just a second. I will find it. No worries. No, no, no rush. No rush. Don't worry. Because it is in my not on my channel. If you go there at this museum, I show these sharpeners. Oh yeah, I found it. Hold on, I found it. Excellent. I found it. Let me see. Oh, let me, I need to go back here. Oh, okay, I'm going here. Let me know if it comes. Do you see that? Uh, not yet. And now? Yes, yes, I can see it now. <laughs> That's the sharpener for bronze swords. Does you that... see that here? You see that here? This is the, that part you 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 sharpen your and the edges on it. And that the the one the handle is made of bronze. You hold it in your hand and then you sharpen. It. Does it, is that a sharpener. goat head or something like that? Or yes, it's a goat head. Yes. Oh, all right. 
it's interesting that you know that lion and goats or lions and bulls actually it was lion and bulls in Persian mythology is very important because you see that that in Persopolis lions attack a bull. You've mm-hmm. seen yeah. that, right? And there is constant battle between a lion and a bull, and there are different uh, different ideas about that uh, to interpret it as usual, right? Symbolism, but you know it doesn't mean that the lion always. Uh, because lion is uh, stands for the sun for the light and then uh, the bull stands for the moon okay so they signal always the changes of seasons when the lion conquers then the summer comes when the bull conquers then the winter comes things like that right and there is a constant battle so that's why many iranian weapons do you see their goats uh, bulls or i mean horned animal <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, an animal with a horn, two horns right and then you see on the other side beside beautiful lions right so that's a uh, quick question uh, is that limestone yes yes right. yeah uh, now that you mention uh, the uh, symbology of the uh, weapons and the uh, artifacts i remember that uh, when i was reading uh, arms and armor from iran the, uh, the first time Uh, yes. I had to uh, take a break and then go read uh, the uh, Shaname. Yes. Because you, uh, and, and there are so many references in the uh, in the text. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. There are many. There are many references in the text. You know. Let me just give you give you one example. I remember when I was a kid, I uh, asked my dad who was Rostam, and he said Rostam is the strongest man. I said, how strong? And he said, ah, very strong. Why? And then my father wanted to get rid of me because he always wanted to lose books. <laughs> and he said, I mean, he's the heaviest man. And I said, how heavy is he? And he told me, he's that heavy. You know, listen, if he walks, right? If he walks, then sometimes he goes into the ground until his knees, that heavy. Okay, but you know, you are a kid, like five, six, I remember. And then you, I believed him. But I'd never ask, okay, if elephants don't go to the ground, <laughs> how could a human being make such a feat? And then the second question which comes up, if you're that heavy, actually you're not meant to fight because you just get stuck on your enemies. <laughs> right? But I remember you know, that time, but Rostam is very strong. And I think in Iran, everyone, based on Javan Mardi, which is very beautiful, because Rostam always... Uh, tries to help or be a nice guy, but in Shahnameh it shows also the weaknesses of this man. Because at the end of the day, he's a human being. Rostam, we should never forget, in spite of all his beauty and Javan Mardi chivalry, he's the man who kills his son. He didn't know it was his son, but he cheated on him. Sohrab won against him, but he cheated on his son. And so he is also the same man who killed uh, Esfandiar, who was, uh, you know, defeating yes, him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you should know because Sh- Sh- because Shahnameh Sh- wants to show you there is no perfect human being, and that's something which we should never forget. That in Persian mythology, in Persian mythology, these people are not God; they are mere human beings with all their strengths and weaknesses. So there is again this Persian mythology stresses there is within you a constant battle between good and evil, which the Chinese again have it. Okay, we are all Asians, you know. <laughs> Sometimes Iranians tend to forget we are Asians as well, yeah, because our Asians. You go to China and uh, Japan, and no, <laughs> Iran is in Asia. We are also Asians, right? <laughs> Sometimes they for time to forget, right? You know, all these uh, Iran are in the Middle East, and so these countries are located where in Asia. Asia. So we're all <laughs> <Asians>. <laughs> you should not forget that, right? Okay, yeah, that's it. <laughs> you know, yeah. So th- th- this is something very, very interesting. The reason for this Rostam is you try to be chivalrous, you try to be this and that, and you see that Iranians when they faced other armies. Like in Shahnameh in the beginning, they send also the Pahlavan to fight against their Pahlavan. You know, if you fight an army like the Mongols who don't believe in these type of things, you are going to be at disadvantage because they're going to shoot you down. I, be- I believe you had mentioned an anecdote. Uh, I think it was a while ago, but uh, you had mentioned that uh, someone had sent out uh, uh, a champion to uh, face off a uh, Mongol army. Yes. 
Yes, that's right. They said to face them, and then the problem of facing them is if if they just look at you and say you want our Sanders are your best champion, but you just shoot him down with two hundred arrows because you don't believe in this facing your champion. Because you are trained to fight as a system, or like in Chinggis Khan, we have this thing in a you know, Persian accounts of Mongols. The guy goes and kills uh, three enemy soldiers, or four come back and say, Khan, I did that. And they said, execute him, because he left his ranks and he tried to boost his ego. So if you have a system, you know, I mean, I need to say that, you know, to me as an executive coach, I'm not so sure if I have ever even succeeded but i tried at least to my limited knowledge or try to establish it within rasmus saw for research for uh, doing research you know you know that carl we have been working together for a long period of time for research i was always uh, giving every researcher working with me now like look with some of them like over 20 years we have been working like with beat which is a great experience uh, you know, I really love what always, I mean, I'm sure he's going to watch it and he always says, I completely trust you, right? That's what Pete says, which is a big pleasure for me to hear what Pete says. You know, I, I try to create a system, not a system which we have at, um, sadly, many universities, that everyone tries to do everything for himself or herself. I try to make a safe haven in Rasmussen, that research is not done like that. that research is shared, but I experienced bad things uh, having this approach, you know that. And the same is in also in a fighting team, right? I tried, and we had also this experience sometimes, but I'm not the only one who had it because I just wanted to say, guys, we are not here into boosting ego. You know, let's put mention this boosting ego. I never forget that. I never forget that someone I really respect and he also wrote a book, I like him as a human being, also about the humanity stresses in his book. Miles Vining, American Marine, who wrote in his book and his experience in Afghanistan. It's not a book like on heroism. It's a book how he accepts bread from Afghan children, how he goes and walks, how he does this and that. But important for him is, I remember for me is when I was talking to him once and I just said, hero, hero on war. Someone who fought, I think four years in Helmand in Afghanistan, he said, what kind of hero? A human being and a hero, that's the joke. Human being and tough, the biggest joke. That's from an American Marine. You see, but you know, when you come and see people who have never fought in a war, which is not, I'm not saying everyone should, you know, please don't misunderstand me, or uh, no MMA experience, no fighting experience, nothing, and they come and think, oh, tough, because they watch some movies and all these things. <laughs> You know, and this gives you <laughs> a completely, because why? Because any type of confrontation we analyze, Makar, is a confrontation which is sad, which is a sad experience, which needs to be done. It's part of our human um, experience, if not culture or if not history. And we need to analyze, but we should never forget this is something which is sad. There, there, and I repeat it, I know many people don't like it. There is no heroism. You know how you teach martial arts. Yeah. You know that. Very practical, where, and there is no heroism in it. <laughs> there is no, nothing, right? And uh, yeah, that's the way it, it should be also in research in this field. Yeah. And unfortunately, uh, we've seen uh, in all fields and everything, egos just uh, get in the way of uh, people. You know, for example, like, like we have, let me just bring this up because it's very important. You say, these guys were 300, like in this 300 movie, and you know, fought against 1 million. I mean, you know, I always give this example. You know that I know many in the US, I know many special forces of police, right? Snipers. And so I always say that, and I asked them, and they were laughing. You know, Rich, Rich is, was a head of a sniper team in the US. And when I say to him, would you enter a neighborhood, a bad neighborhood, bad? I mean, what is bad? A dangerous neighborhood, a dangerous, what is dangerous? Okay, a not stable neighborhood. Let me just use this <laughs> term. <laughs> would you enter a non-stable neighborhood with 10 um, police force or snipers or fighters? 10, 10. And you're all, uh, you have all your arms and weapons. Would you, excuse me, only an idiot would. 
and we are talking with all these modern weapons and you enter the streets of a bad neighborhood. Now use bad again, it was this uh, unstable neighborhood, right? Uh, but then the, the thing is, the whole idea behind it is, no. So now please tell me, how would 300, no matter how courageous they were, fight against 1 million courageous men? You see, <laughs> you see, yeah. so, and you see, and it doesn't matter from which side it comes. You know, for example, sometimes I read texts, I translate them. We had, let's say, Iranian history, I translate them because it's part of it. But many of them, they want to praise the king. Sometimes the king was fighter, but sometimes I know the Iranian history, that king, the last thing he did, he didn't even pick up a shamshi. And I'm sure that guy, based judged by his looks, he could not even walk two meters <laughs> in a full armor, Safavid armor. I mean, an armor, I have two replicas of it, and I'm an athlete, I believe I'm an athlete, I train four hours a day, and this guy, and this guy who is um, praising the king says, king, you are the best swordsman in the world, <laughs> with your armor walking all over the place, and I just said, this king cannot even walk for two meters, I mean, and he cannot definitely walk in the armor. Because he's simply not fit. He was not fit. So you see, this is a praise, but I'm not going to take it at face value that this king now was using his shamshi. He cannot even three minutes with his shamshi do cuts in the air. I mean, <laughs> can he wear an armor? Yeah, you know, you still got to keep the uh, the people who's the, the person who's paying the bills happy. <laughs> You know, so we need to take these things with, you know, a pinch of salt when we read. As but what is important in this text for me? Because the same text describes, describes to me, for me, how back then rockets worked for military purposes. That's from, that's from uh, Persia for Encilia. Yes. All right. Yeah, but I need to be... You know, very. I, I keep everything which is in the manuscript there. You know, one of my archery manuscripts describes how to pray, how you should do ritual washing. But I put okay. it there because it's part of it. But then, if I come back that the king was such a brave man and I <laughs> take it at the face value, I mean, come on, just read historical accounts on this guy. There were some kings who were fighters, but there were some kings who were not fighters. And I need to really do my research and not be taken. You know. <laughs> By surprise nature, if I make such a such an assumption, you know, so it's important, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, still, uh, I know you just mentioned three hundred, and uh, that's one uh, move where, for some reasons, people just took that as a documentary and uh, and start thinking, okay, Persians went to battle naked, which is obviously not the case. Yeah. No. No. Perhaps I mean, the, the whole idea. Of is as well, you know, you know, Akamanid armor. We are writing actually an article together mm -hmm. with Beat on Akamanid armor. We did on Sasanids. We're going to do it also Akamanid soon. But yeah, of course. I mean, you know, you know, you know we talked about it. I'm going to do some test uh, cutting tests on that. A simple gambeson, a simple gambeson protects you, doesn't it? Yeah. A real good one. Absolutely. Against cuts, definitely. And trusts are not that easy on that either, Cart. Not that you can just trust who you want. People always think people went to the battlefield naked, right? <laughs> <laughs> they didn't, right? Who would? You yeah, know? That, that, that you mentioned Gambazons, I mean, it's... Uh, again, uh, people coming mostly from a gaming background think, okay, yeah. cloth armor is the worst, it's, the, uh, it's obviously useless. <laughs> But again, I think most people have the experience. If they, if they think cloth armor, they're thinking uh, a t-shirt, which yes. is obviously not the case. I mean, if you look at a oh. gambeson, you've got a very thick layer of padding. Yes. Well, you know, it is like it reminds me also when you know I forgot the name of this book. Ah, uh, an Arab Syrian gentleman. Oh, okay. I, I, you, you, had, you had you had mentioned that to me. Yeah. But could yeah. could you go over it, please? Yeah. Now, for example, you know, they say you know we had you know we had this discussion with. Um, with Mohsen, Mohsen Ketabchi, our new member. Unfortunately, he doesn't speak English, not at all, so he cannot communicate with you guys. He speaks only Persian. Very great guy, and he did lots of research, and he's a very good in animation. He teaches at the University of Animation in really? Tehran. Right. Yeah, he's very really good. And he does also in a, in, a, in a school of animation. He's good at animation, right? And, he's, and I always told him, look, all these talks about animation, 
you know, and he always laughs. I mean, these are all exaggerations. Forget about it. Make your animations realistic. And he says, yeah, but, and you know, they had a very, you know, they had like a, a Sassanid armor based on Izad Bahram. And he's, you know, covered everywhere. This, I mean, it's like a full plate armor of your, they made, he didn't do it. There was a design. He did it, but someone, he might imitate it without his permission, but that's another issue. But this guy looks really covered everywhere, everywhere, right? And I looked and I said, mm -hmm. and I said, yeah. So do you think many people had it? And I said, you know, where did he serve? In T's food. Now, okay, this is in today's Iraq, which was one of the centers, capital of Sassanid Empire. You know that Iraq is not Tehran, where you know teaspoon is. It's hot. Yeah. So how long did this guy <laughs> survive in that armor? You know, because we know that, you know, we know that our, uh, Sassanid used mostly, mostly male armor, right? Right. But there was a reason for it. The whole idea is, if this was a battlefield, you know, people forget one thing. You are going to dehydrate very fast. And once you dehydrate, you know that I put my, this 100-man fights, the reason was not fighting. I wanted to see when my blood thickens. You know, many people, some people in the beginning didn't understand why I was doing it. How would it happen to your reaction? What would happen, excuse me, to your reactions? And I tell you from my own experience on my own body, and I do lots of sports day in, day out. And I was having water after 10 rounds. You remember? Uh, yeah, it was, and I was not, And I was not having full armor. I had hallucination. I had problems because my blood was thickened. And you should never forget, you don't drink water, you keep going, you're going to have a heart attack because of thick blood. Very simple. Now, question for you is, when the Muslims were fighting, fighting the Franks, as they called them, Crusades, right? they called them Saracens, but most of them were Turkish tribes, Kurdish and yep. Turkish tribes, and they called them Franks, and, but not all of them were Frankish. That's very beautiful how people classify each other, right? Absolutely. Anyhow. <laughs> Both sides classifying and going to know what they were doing. But anyhow, today it hasn't changed that much, unfortunately. But when they were fighting, this guy, Usama, mm -hmm. orders his guys not to confront them, just keep shooting at them. So make sure they don't get, get out of the armor. Get out of the armor, even breeze. So they look like hedgehogs, but then they go after a while, fall off. Why? Second plot. <laughs> You don't even need to engage. Why should you go and do heroic deeds? You see? Same thing is when Miles told me. You know, you see that noise. Again, I cannot go into that detail here, but in YouTube, you never know. But okay. You know that American army, when they were in Iraq, they had this full, uh, they developed a full armor. Mm -hmm. So you see that when they were shot at with a sniper, sometimes they went down and came up. Nothing okay. happened to them. And I asked Miles, did you use it? He said, no. It was so heavy, sometimes you wish to be hit by a bullet, but not to be in that damn thing under the sun. You see that? You hear that? You see? So you, then it comes to you, what is the military engagement? How long would it take? You know, the question, you know that. Did everyone use full plate armor? Of course not, because full plate armor is, is for a short confrontation, like break a line, yes. If it's for dwelling, yeah, okay, you dwell, then drink water. You know, but if it is for an extended time on the battlefield, before even engaging your enemy, you're going to have a heart attack or you're yeah, going absolutely. to dehydrate and die. And, you know? Yeah, and if I'm correct, for example, in the uh, case you mentioned from uh, Usama, uh, that wasn't even the uh, a battlefield, that was the uh, as they were traveling from place to place. Yeah, so you see, and I, that's what I said, you know, only concentrate on we uh, weapons and only reading these fished bushes, which is not wrong, gives you a wrong impression. Gives you a wrong, wrong heroic impression. There is no heroism in these things. There is no hero. What kind of hero? A human being, a mere human, mortal human being is a hero? What kind of hero? And who is a hero? Yeah, I can mention, in my humble opinion, hero is a person who helps people. That's a hero. <laughs> Why are you a hero to your wielding? And now I'm saying it as a fighter, all day training. But, you know, this is, okay, this guy is a soldier, served in a unit, and fought for a system. But he is not a hero. 
He fought for his system. That's it. And he needs to be part of his system. And I'm, I'm interested in analyzing the tools used in that system, units and people use those tools, and what cohesiveness regarding the military culture was, you know, uniting them in that system. Anything else, I'm not into computer games. Exactly. You know? yeah. You know, yeah. so, so that's you know that being said. <laughs> and regarding that as well, then you know, then my research grows. Okay, then more manuscripts. You know, and I mentioned it. Okay, why did they have this thick uh, armor? Did you need to face those weapons? Ah, oh, firearms. They wanted to hold out these muskets. What is? Yeah, for example. Yeah, firearms here. You know, we had it as well here, or these, or that, or I mean. There are many, many aspects of warfare we need to take into consideration, right? And you know that as well. You know that as well. What if someone brings me down? Let's give two, two precepts. Someone, I'm in a good armor, brings me down, sits on me, and tries to stab me with a, with a hanja. Then I need to also to wrestle so he doesn't bring me down. But once I'm down and he's trying to stab me, then all of a sudden, I say it as a wrestler and also as a guy who has been doing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu now for 13 years. You mostly don't see the hands of the guy because you're trying to lock him. You don't see what's going on behind you. With the, That's the, I mean, one of the things in wrestling and BJJ, you don't see the hands all the time. You're not holding his hands. You're locking. And now you see, then you see, okay, the nature of fight, bringing down is dangerous. You need to fight so he doesn't bring you down because your armor will not help you once he sits on you. Mm-hmm. But if you're down and try to counter him, you need to be aware if he has a short weapon, you are not doing wrestling or BJJ on the ground. This is a different thing. Oh, yeah, and then, and then, yeah, absolutely, it changes all your techniques. Or do you wait to get an armbar when he has a hanja in his hand? I mean, what kind of armbar, right? You just do it once, right? You know, in his free hand, you know. So, and then, then you think about it in a system orientation, you're trying to, okay, holding him down and his friends come to you. We see it in self-defense, it's the, the most dangerous things to do. Why? Because they kick you in the head. Yeah, but back then they had weapons, swords, lances, and they come at you. Yeah, they you don't see? need to kick you in the head. <laughs> <laughs> they don't need to kick you in the head. You see, that's, that's why we in research need, or in martial arts, in historical martial arts, take these things into consideration. The more I train, the less I'm interested in these one-to-one fights because they're just like a game, a deadly game. I agree. Back then, back then, I mean, not now, a deadly game. Yeah, but a game. And I'm a military historian. I'm interested in systems. I'm not interested in individuals trying to prove I'm better than you. To be honest, I don't care. <laughs> this is not for me. <laughs> you know? I, I think you had mentioned at some point uh, when we were having a conversation a few days ago that uh, uh, in Persian culture you 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 don't get uh, respect based on how much uh, of a fighter you are. Yeah. No, no, um, no. Um, I mean, Persian culture, in spite of all those reverence and the respect they show for Rostam for Sohrab, for Pahlavan. Persian culture, per se, is a culture like Chinese. Chinese is the same. Warrior is secondary. Scholar is first. Okay. Definitely. Scholar is first. Warrior is always secondary, right? If any. If any. Because, uh, you know, and that's what where the Persian culture always emphasizes that. You see, recede again and again. And Chinese has it as well. Did China have bad military or soldiers? Of course not. One of the best functional machines in human history. People always concentrate on 19th century. As Dr. Kissinger says himself in his book on China, we should not get lost by the last stage where British imperialism, this is the word doctor of Dr. Kissinger, right? Uh, weaken them because they spread, uh, you know, the use of drugs, free drugs, so they, you know, but China was an empire for uh, centuries, right? Yeah. And it, powerful, but still, if you go to Chinese culture, you see that in Chinese culture, they emphasize, they emphasize the scholar above the warrior. In some other cultures, they emphasize the warrior, but that's not the Persian culture. The Persian culture is a scholar, which is uh, placed above everything. That's why Persian poems, Persian literature, 
Persian art and all these things are reign supreme in these uh, fields, right? In the in Iran, they are very important to take into. Yeah, uh, that, that also explains because one of the things that always surprised me is how uh, meticulous docu meticulously documented everything is in Persian. Yes, yes. You know that we talked about it. There are, I found in my um, studies there are m many manuscripts on how to wash yourself. If you yeah, go yeah. and want to wash, and uh, do you use this and uh, this? And there are like hundreds of pages on how to wash yourself. And there are different manuscripts on that, right? <laughs> And then we just say, God, what, what is this, right? You know, why do they write about that even? You know, it's, it's interesting. Imagine now you sit and someone writes such a book, you challenge the guy because you say, no, this way you are not cleaned in uh, you know, a <laughs> nice way. So you are challenging, you write your own way of washing or so. And you write your book on that by hand. <laughs> it's just amazing. <laughs> it is fascinating. It's uh... yeah, it's amazing, right? <laughs> really fascinating. Yeah, you know, and the question which I always had, you know, I was talking to a friend. Uh -huh. and I said, "Oh, you should translate this because there are more people interested in these things than weapons, like washing or on, yeah, <laughs> or on, yeah. For example, you can just oh, this is like a like a wellness combined with a wellness." I said, "Come on, man, this is not my area. I mean, I don't know what to do in this field, right?" <laughs> <laughs> but you know it is fascinating i need to say you know because someone believes if you for example wash your hair first is better and someone believes and i remember i was just going trying to make comparison if you start with your feet it's better i mean then at the end of the day maybe i'm too simple minded i just what the hell would a difference would it make i mean it's not like you make crucible steel and ingredients make a better steel but what i translate i mean i don't see any difference but then maybe <laughs> Because of my limited mind, maybe it makes a difference if you wash your hair first in a certain way, and then your feet, or other way around. You see? Right. <laughs> no, <laughs> I, I, I just think it's amazing that uh, yeah. not only someone wrote a book about this, but uh, multiple books wrote on the subject. Yes. <laughs> no, I think when someone writes a book back then, they all try to imitate, try to you know say, I'm better than you, exceed his skills. So then the whole battle of writing starts, right? I think so, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, someone mentioned, yeah, that's how uh, you get riots about the best way to uh, put your socks on. People start to... <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, maybe, yes, maybe, you know. I mean, there are actually also of um, you know making cloths. There are many also attire. There are many Persian manuscripts on that. How to do them? How to sew them? How to make them? I mean, there are also many on uh, cooking recipes. Many books. You know, I think I told you once I was reading from Safavid period. He said, uh, "What did he say? Let me just remember. Get a lamb. You have guests. Yes. No, no. You have two or three guests. Yes." And you need to make sure that they have enough food. Yeah, get a lamb which is fat and big enough. Okay, it doesn't give you any kilos. And then add this, add these two kilos. Okay, it doesn't say kilo. They had another weight back then. Let's say two kilo of potatoes, this and this, and three kilos of rice. I'm just trying to make it up, but approximately. And then prepare the whole thing with all those ingredients. And when the lamb is enough, if ready, put it there, and then try to design it. It looks, and then you say, God. And then when it's finished, eat it with those three guests. And I was just looking, Jesus, <laughs> how did you even eat that? <laughs> and then I was, you know, I was talking to a friend. Okay, um, you know that I'm always into diet. I had no sugar diet for the last three and a half years. Eat this, eat this. Your, and didn't they have a heart attack or something like that? And a friend of mine said, back then they didn't care. They didn't even know. They just died. <laughs> <laughs> eating until they died but you know you know imagine I'm just, and the dimensions of cuisine were always so huge get a lamb get a this get and i said god can you just restrict it like i mean a bit limited no i mean everything <laughs> is you know a lot <laughs> Yeah, so. Okay, uh, by the way, for anyone uh, watching, if you're interested in uh, Persian cuisine, uh, the doctor also has some uh, videos on his channel where uh, 
you just you just you do stick to more human uh, proportions, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was in old channel. Yeah, I remember that. I remember but in this new channel, I didn't transfer them because I figured out. Uh, I just stick to research, right? Oh, oh you didn't put them up. Ah. <laughs> No, sadly not. They were an old, they were an old channel. But, uh, but if you guys want, I can do it. No problem. Uh, there were there, there were some really good recipes in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is. You know, cooking is like making a crucible steel, like adding things and uh, you know, <laughs> to the pot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah just yeah. a bit. You can eat it, eat it, eat it at the end. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, right. uh, if I may, can I bring up a picture of this uh, X? Go. Oh, that's beautiful, yes. And yeah, I wanted to ask you about the uh, decorations in the, uh, on the blade. Yeah. Yes, this is... Um, this is... Um, 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 okay, this is um, an axe, there are two of them, and I analyzed them um, in my book, Arms and Armor from Iran. If uh, my memory doesn't fail me, I analyzed thousands of pieces, but I think I don't I remember, it's from Nader Shah or Naderi era. I think you don't see it here because it's too distant, it's made of patterned crucible steel. Okay. And um, the sides are you know, gilded, as you can see it, gilded, and then some designs are just made into that. So it's a floral design. Normally, Persians, they have floral or vegetal design. Okay. Or combination of both, floral or vegetal design. And each of these flower, flowers have a certain meaning, even from Achaemenid period, right? For example, in Achaemenid period, Lotus was the symbol of kingdom, flower, right. lotus. In Persian, uh, the name is a girl's name, Nilufar, uh, which is lotus. I mean, the name of my daughter is also Nilufar. And um, if you go there and you know, look at the surface of this, you see that uh, this is a uh, hunting. Hunting um, is a very important. You see, again, the lion. You see that it's a Persian lion attacking, you know. Yes, an uh, it's in the uh, bottom yeah. left. It, it's on, yes. the, uh, on the beak, yeah. Yes, and hunting is always was always a pastime of kings, but we should never forget that hunting back then uh, also was a feat of bravery and military training. Mongols did the same; all armies back then did it. Um, in Asia, definitely, because hunting. Uh, you know, for example, let me just give you an example of how Mongols did it and come back to this uh, axe. Mongols, um, you know, extended the army, so they went like this. They went and separated and kept the line and then close an area off with many, many soldiers, cavalry. So they uh, started to walk in the circle, make the circle closer, and killed every animal they found there. Right? Once the circle was uh, you know, close to each other, they had all those animals killed. So they used them, of course. It's not that you just killed them. They used them during hunting season. But um, I know it's very bad, and I, I realize that, um, poor animals. But we should remember, okay, back then they lived from animals. I mean, as we do today, as far as you're not, if you're not vegetarian or you're not a vegan. But um, um, back then, so they hunted them and they needed them, but we should never forget hunting was a method of learning how to fight and bring it to an end. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because you know, I, from two different reasons. If I train and spar with swords, mm-hmm. what is the end? Right? The end is uh, that it hits you and it's okay, good. I mean, we have Safavid accounts. Shardan in Iran explained that they fought with training swords, right? They are there, but this is, doesn't come to an end. So this end was practiced two ways first, by hunting, and second, sadly, in real military encounters, right? So, yeah. so hunting was a, a essential tool, right? And based on that, hunting was also a royal or kingly uh, feat, where kings were this and that. And we should never forget. Sometimes they also faced animals like lions back then with a sword. We have this as well with a, a spear, or also boars. Now in Iran, we have many strong boars. I mean, just face a boar, 
with a lance on horseback and see what happens. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, not as easy as we think, right? Yeah. And uh, so they did that, right? So and then these scenes, you see that there are hunting scenes which come and uh, many Persian arms and armor. And um, this is one of them, right? So this is chiseled. Uh, patterned crucible steel is extremely a tough material. And once you want to chisel it, it takes lots of time and effort to chisel it and make these beautiful things, as you can see. It's, I mean, I don't know what to say. It's a wooden handle covered with uh, leather, the handle, the shaft, I mean. And uh, it's a beautiful piece. I mean, I mean, it's made of patterned crucible steel. I mean, better than that, you cannot have it. Well, it works. <laughs> And uh, when you were saying uh, chiseling, would that require special tools? Because uh, crucible steel really is very, very, very hard. I don't think you're. Yeah. Uh, I don't think you can overstate that. <laughs> no, one of the hardest materials. Yes. Yeah, the, the terrifying thing is would would be like uh, making a mistake while you're chiseling that because that would. Be <laughs> oh God! This is. Oh God! Yeah. Then you need to make it again, right? Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, I have a question about uh, the weapons that a uh, soldier of the spirit would be carrying. Like, uh, because I know that there are some accounts like uh, of a horseman and uh, how he should carry his mace and his axe and his uh, shamshir and so on. So would they be carrying all these weapons on them at the same time? How, how did that work? Uh, so the question is if they were carrying different weapons. Yeah, exactly. Yes, they were carrying different weapons. They had the lance, they had a, they had a bow, normally two bows, then they had the lance, then they had, uh, they on the saddle, they had an, either an axe or a mace or sometimes both, normally this, then they had the short weapons, hanja, cart, on the belt, then, um, yes, and then, the, of course. So that's what they did, right? That's what they did. I see. <clears throat> but is, uh, is is it the case like for example okay uh, now he's going to dismount he's going to use his axe and whatever or uh, were there like tactical roles for uh, yes of course of course I mean depending on the situation we had some as far as you can discuss it with the Umran the old Shah Ismail Safavi for example before his defeat in Chaldaran they had cavalry units only dismounted if they were forced to, but later on they again reintegrated the loss of infantry if you want to do it. And if you want to go back the, during Safa, uh, Sassanid or Parthian, they all uh, part, excuse me, Sassanid and Achaemenid, Achaemenian, they always had infantry combined, different roles, different things. You know, um, the thing is, uh, in my opinion, of course, you can have like lance wielders, you can have cavalry, you can have uh, infantry, you can have later on musket holders. You can, this mm -hmm. is then, the more weapons get uh, technologically advanced, the, the better you can do that. But, you know, and then you assign, you assign to every troop different weapons, then the whole idea is how you want to go ahead and do it. If, let me just mention that just to have this idea. For those of you who want to go into military studies and understand the mechanics of fighting and not get lost with all these uh, uh, games, right? <laughs> there are two ways. Either you join the military, which I'm not saying you should. This is one thing, which you, I mean, I'm just saying that. Even today, it doesn't matter because each military never forget is a system orientation. It is irrelevant what kind of weapons they use, right? You understand what I mean? And this is a sad story. This is never a beautiful story. Because you know what's the man is. Or either you do that, or you start to use your imagination. If you served in the police forces, you understand that. I mentioned that to you. The military is always like that, to demoralize and to finish off the motivation of the fighting units on the other side. So the whole idea is, if you are outnumbered, you want to know what outnumbered means? Again, give you this example to you. I give you the best weapons. 
sell 10 of you to enter a very dangerous place. And there are hundreds and hundreds of people hiding in houses around you. And you just say, you need to walk through the street in the middle and just run to the other side. Who would do that? <laughs> you have the best weapons, right? So you're outnumbered, you know, it's a dangerous situation. So you don't want to face it, which is normal human reaction. In warfare, it's the same thing. You're outnumbered. You see that many people around you, well, go. You know what I mean? I don't want to use these bad words, right? And then uh, all of a sudden, you lose your spirit to fight and then you surrender, right? And, and surrendering is not one surrender, one keeps fighting. Uh, the reality of war sadly doesn't look like that. The reality of war is either collectively surrender or they collectively fight. And if someone disagrees, it's not like a disagreement in a boardroom or in a company, right? So it, it looks, uh, yes, it looks a bit different. If you, yeah, you, know. you can imagine a group of uh, scared people yeah. with weapons having a disagreement is not going to end well. Yeah, exactly. So, you, you know, and these are realities of things we need to say. So this is this isolation. This is this putting on the pressures of one group. And the more these groups lose heart, surrender, or give up or escape, the more they increase. So your system is going to have upper hand, either by outnumbering them or by outmaneuvering them or by outclassing them by the best, better technology and weapons you use. So basically, that's the whole time you're being placed under pressure. Now, how you want to choose it, choose the weapon. You know, one thing which as a fighter, and I, this is not, not as a researcher, I remember I was a young guy, and one of my specialties, as, as far as striking is concerned, is a wheel kick or a back kick. I can do both very well, and I can do very strong. I can deliver wheel kicks very strong, back kicks very strong. So it became my specialty. In the beginning, I couldn't. It takes years to deliver them in a fight, not just in the air. And I always ask my instructor, I was a teenager, and so why am I, I cannot do back, he's always tried to do it, they counter me. And he said, because you don't want to. And so what do you mean you don't want to? He said, because when you, the moment you start to turn, you think they are going to catch you, throw you down, or they're going to counter you. So what do you do? <clears throat> and he said, don't think about the angle. Because I said, is the angle like this or this? And he said, he said man, just throw it. And he was a Kyokushin instructor. <laughs> and I said, no, the, the angle, I want to get it. And he said, you know, your problem is you try to do the angle. Just turn and kick. And I just turned and kicked. And ever since, I can do it. <laughs> you know, I just turned and kicked. So why am I saying it? In warfare is also this, you use your weapons to do these things, I mentioned that. And it's not that, oh, no, the last fighters come. Oh, in the between, there are some people shooting with uh, with bows. Oh, now someone comes and with the gores and with the mace comes. And then now this comes. Guys, this is sadly not a computer game. People scream. People get wounded. People go. People ugh, don't want to be there. Back then and now, the same thing. We should never forget that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, having the distance between between us and uh, this subject tends to uh, make people fall more into a pattern of but what if this, but what if that, and we forget the uh, there's something very messy going on at the end. Yeah, exactly. That's that's really a major factor to take into consideration. Now, I don't want to discourage. I just want to mention that that. Often when I, uh, when I, um, you know, I remember that, you know, for example, just one, one exa two examples, I'll give you why this gaming mentality is dangerous. Mm -hmm. You know that, oh, I think in my channel, I show one. I do you remember, I don't know if I did it in Persian or in English. Sometimes I forget to do it one or other way around. <laughs> At least in, in, I do most things in English because English is lingua franca. I mean, if I do it in German, Persian or Spanish or French is secondary. Because English is important as lingua franca, but I don't remember. Maybe I didn't do it in English. If not, just please let me know. I can do it in English as well. Because, and I, uh, I have the video already. I can make a voiceover. There is a really, really huge Dao and the Chinese use. And they use this Dao mostly as infantry against the legs of horsemen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. I remember this video. Yeah, you, you did do it. In you English. remember that huge sword? Yeah. I, this is too good. This is really too wow. We, how large it is. So now, please remember that. And then 
uh, many of these horse riders always told me in some circles, right? Here in Europe, also in the US, mostly in Europe, back then horses were so valuable. Now listen, listen, that they <clears throat> preferred to die, but not to, to hurt the horse of their opponent. Just please let us <laughs> analyze this text. So I'm fighting as an infantry. I prefer to die rather to hurt the horse. And he said, yeah, at least try to kill the, the rider. So then unmount him or dismount him, sorry, and then get on the horse. So you are the fighter on the horse. The horse uh, is the value. I don't see that working, to be honest. Exactly. First of all, we all know that they killed the horses. Oh, yeah, horses you. were seen as a, as a weapon. First, you see, the problem is because with this gaming, we enter a field. We enter a field which is not realistic at all. You know, for, let me just give, I don't want to go into detail here. We are not, we are not in a military academy, but this is one thing which is extremely important. And I don't want to go into detail because it's on the YouTube channel. But one thing which is very important is the following. Trench warfare. One of the saddest things of trench warfare is you sit in a trench, you're fighting, shooting, all those explosions. If it falls into your trench, you're gone, or you're here and this. But all these are secondary. The thing is, two things, or, which are, or, uh, or two things before that are important. How do you feed your troops, right? to bring all those trench lines. And after you feed them, excuse me, excuse you, what happens? They shoot, you know what I mean. And they should do it a couple of times. So if they cannot leave their trenches, what happens? Do you hear me, Carr? Yeah, and you, do, you need some way to, way to get rid of the sewage. Since yes. we're on YouTube, uh, keep it, keep it uh, simple. See? So, so far for heroism and heroic acts in warfare, you know? And why am I saying this? Because this gaming, you see a knight comes shining armor and then and people get so excited. First he uses his lance or then he goes to archery. I don't remember. And then does this and that and all these things and all those uh, beautiful people watching him. And, you know, <laughs> and, uh, okay, it doesn't, it never looked like that. It has, it never looked like it. No, it didn't look like that. And it has never looked like that. And it is now, it's not look, going to look like that anyway. So it never looked like that. It's not that, oh, war, wars, or no, so nasty. No, no, no. Even in Bronze Age warfare, this was the same thing, right? So nothing changed. You know? So we don't need to get excited about these things, you know? And I think having a realistic approach and knowing what we are writing about, because, you know, a piece of writing, as I said, it gets out your ideas, no matter how much you try to hide it. You understand what I mean? Yeah. So that's why it's important that we are realistic in this field, very realistic in this field. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, realism, unfortunately, is something that uh, gets misinterpreted a lot. Yeah. It's, it, it either gets bent or lost or uh, thrown around somehow. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yes, yes. Okay, uh, we're getting close to uh, one hour and forty-five minutes. Yes. But uh, before we wrap up, I'd like to uh, ask you a bit of a few questions about uh, archery in particular. Sure. Okay, and I bring up a photo of a bow. Yes. I think this is unstrung at the moment. Mm-hmm. But there are some beautiful patterns on it, and uh, uh, I remember that uh, in Persian culture, uh, archery is uh, highly uh, respected. Yes, that's right. Highly respected. And I remember you telling me that there were a ton of ways to uh, train an archer. Could you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, this is this is a composite bow, right? I mean, uh, this is a composite bow, which in the middle, it is made of wood, right? And different types of wood, so we don't need to go into that. And then, then on one side, you use the, 
the horn and on the other side you use sinew and then you use glue to stick them together and uh, then um yeah this is a composite bow and you know um this one is a really heavy Persian bow. And you know, this is bent this way when you want it just to string it, you pull it and then, okay, there's different techniques. You can sit down and put it between your knees and then put it there. And composite bows are very, very, you know, have uh, back then big poundages. It's not like what many people use today. Um, you know, I was talking with Bead, you know, they, they use the poundages starting from like uh, 90, even 120. Even as, 100 as a starting? No, 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 for warfare. I mean. Ah, okay. okay. No, of course not for warfare. <laughs> okay. I was wondering because that's... Uh... <laughs> no, 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 for warfare. So you see that, you know, just to have... I mean, it's nothing wrong that many people use if they get on horseback or on foot, they use 30 pounds and all these things they shoot. It gives you, again, a different uh, attitude, right? Because back then, there were like weapons. And then I, I translated as a sad uh, and annotated, I think, yeah, definitely nine archery manuscripts and each one of them talks about different uh, uh, techniques for example you can have and you know how to lock your thumb is like this you know for example these are like uh, thumb archery right thumb lock right and then you have a zehkir you have um, you have zehkir and goshtfane right and then you use it to pull it and then there are also different ways for example do i pull it up here which is borut kesh right which is a mustache throw or do I put, put abru kesh, right, like here? Let me just, or do I put sine kesh, which is chest row, right? And, you know, just to give an example, when I started to translate, uh, many people based on Turkish archery said mustache throw is the best, best, because mustache throw gives you a line here. You see that? When you are here, it gives you a line in um, on foot archery. But then we saw that um, I translated and I had this discussion with me that it wrote that people from Isfahan prefer uh, uh, eyebrow draw. So here, to your eyebrow. Is that because they were shooting from horses or something like that? Yeah, yeah. Right? And horses and down, or if you're down, or if you're on a horse, chest draw, they say is the best. Okay. But you see, they say it, but some others say no. Again, mustache throw is the best. You see also in miniatures, mustache throw a lot also on horseback. So you see, they did not agree with each other. Also, how to hold the, how to grasp the bow handle. Is it like Changale Boss? Is it like this? Is it like this, 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 this? So you can combine different types of hold the bow, how to uh, do the lock, how to bring it here, how to stand on horseback, on foot, and all these manuscripts talk about that. And they agree or disagree with each other. So there are different techniques, there are different tactics, and they use it. Yeah. Then, yeah. This is, we are going to put all these books together with Pete and write a, one book on them, compare all techniques together, and put all of them into practice. It's, it's always fascinating because there, were, there are so many variations of. Uh... You know, someone someone uh, just coming into into uh, into archery might think, oh, okay, you uh, hold up the bow, you pull the string, uh, you fire. <laughs> no. But no, there are so many <laughs> so defined variations. It's incredible. No, and then there are also archery tools, right? Mm, oh, you yeah. can have Novaki Kapse, you can have arrow guide, you can have different type of things and uh, do it. And there are uh, yeah, really many different things. Yeah, I, I remember the uh, Navakabs. I remember you telling me uh, not to try it at home because I would shoot my hand off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for example, things like that. You know, you shoot balls, right? You turn, let's say, you turn your bow somehow in a crossbow. And uh, then, yeah, I mean, <laughs> you need to be really careful uh, when you do this. At the end of the day, we know that if you do it, uh, if you do archery, doing archery is like that. I mean, archery, practicing archery on its own, um, I don't want to stab on anyone's toes. It's not... Um, it's a sport. It's, not, it's a sport. You need to do martial arts. You need to do wrestling. You need to do swordsmanship. You need to do to cut things you need to go and fight and punch and kick and do all these things because archery is only one part of it. no matter how big the poundage of, of your bow is it is like it is like you know do i need to cut things of course if you don't 
fighting only with a blunt will never ever help you to understand the mechanics of a sharp sword. But the other way around, if I only cut things and never spark, <laughs> what the hell is that? You see, so what we can do is, in my humble opinion, you need to be in constant <clears throat> training in different fields to gain an idea how these things were put into practice. That's, that's the only thing, yeah. Okay, uh, so uh, someone is asking, uh, Stephen is asking, how did they make these bows? I think that might be too long of a discussion to, <laughs> to go oh into right God. now. Oh, <laughs> God. You know, uh, Stephen says that, you know, I have, um, if you go to the, um, uh, my channel, Razmafsar TV, and uh, search in the channel Archery, you find many, many artic articles, many videos on archery how I discuss mostly with bead, but not only with bead, with bead, and we discuss about how these bows were made. And you can find detailed information. If you're more into reading, if you go to my academia, there are free access academic articles on the construction of these bows as well. Yeah, I think I recall in uh, Persian Archer and Swordsmanship, I think you also uh, yeah. go into to, uh, to some extent, especially like with uh, types of woods de depending on uh, the yeah. different environments they must be used in. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, okay. We almost haven't said anything about armor, which is uh, pretty unfortunate. But uh, again, that's a massive subject. Maybe you can come on another time and uh, yes. we can talk just about that. Yes, yes. Armor is a bar. The huge field, right? Again, oh God, yeah. <laughs> armor or firearms, even, right? You know? Or firearms, yeah, because uh, again, that's a that, uh, whole other area, especially the uh, artillery and different types of artillery. Yes. Uh, what, one thing that I'd like you to uh, talk to us about a little is uh, shields, uh, the support. Yes. Because I think, especially in the uh, uh, this type of shield is very different from uh, other uh, types of European shields that people see in museums and uh, stuff like that. And I don't think that uh, sapphires are very common in uh, most places. Yes. Um, the whole idea of a sapphire, if you show it, is to leave your hand uh, free. So you can, you know, for example, I, I just made a video. Maybe I'm going to place, put it a uh, short on uh, YouTube today. Okay. So, you know, just, you know, if you're fighting, this is shield, and this is my shamshir. If I come and grab them, like, put my shield behind it, so I can use the shamshir in the left hand, or I can have a khanjar, as you showed it, a dagger there. I can have a dagger and fight, right? Or I can have a bow, hold a bow, and shoot with a bow, and having a shield. I, right? I remember Which that is... you had a video about that one uh, on YouTube. Yeah. That, that was uh, really interesting. The whole idea is that the shield does not block your offhand. Right? Exactly, so, so that you can still manipulate things with it. Yes, that's the whole idea. Uh, I know that some people ask, like, uh, why is the shield so small? Um, okay. <laughs> you know, I made a video uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Small shield, large, uh, medium-sized shield, and large shield, right? Um. Okay, let's put it this way. First of all, when you use a small shield, in, in order to understand what a small shield is, right? Small shield is, um, imagine it is like a khanja. If you know how to fight with a small shield, you can have a dagger and fight with shorts, without a shield in your hand, in your offer, right? When you, without the shield, just. just you can have yeah. a shamshir and then you can fight like you, I do it right. in these. Yes. Um, and it's, you can have a game, you can have an, any other weapon in your left hand. Now, imagine, once you have a shield in your weapon, in your left hand, people start to think, okay, the question is, if I have a khanja, now imagine I have a khanja here, right? Okay. If I have a khanja, can I go and hide behind the khanja? I mean, you do it only once, you cannot hide behind the khanja. <laughs> Same is with the shield. The shield is not that, that you go and hide behind a small shield. It's there to deflect the weapon of um, your opponent, the main weapon, or also or also to contact with it. You can do it with the khanja as well. Admittedly, with the khanja is much harder because you need to be able to hook 
many people sacrifice their fingers because there are no knife fighter. They don't know how to hook, right? Or you can do it with a card, or you can do it with a kame. So the, sh the shield is that you constantly move behind it. And that's why in Rasmus, I teach always a small shield because you can transfer it to this. A large shield, you cannot do these manipulations, which I use. A large shield, which is here, you hide behind it and you fight, you hide behind it, you fight. I don't like a large shield. I know I need to teach it, but I always believed a large shield is for someone who is, uh, um, well, who is, well, who is not that courageous, maybe? <laughs> no, uh, okay, I take it back. No, it has nothing to do with courage. No, no, I just, okay. He's someone who is not that well trained, okay? So he needs a large shield to hide, and it gives you better protection, of course. It gives you better protection. Yeah, one of the things I uh, found with the uh, smallest separate is that, uh, yeah, uh, the first time I saw it, I was like, this is tiny. How, how is this going to work? Yeah. But but once you get used to the idea of uh, moving it around, then uh, then you, you start to understand how uh, how useful it is. <laughs> Carl, you realize how much protection it gives. Oh you. yeah, absolutely. Right, it gives you lots of protection. Plus, in, in context, it would be used with armor and uh, other stuff. So uh, yeah. Yes, absolutely. But yeah, definitely, even the fact that uh, you can uh, gauge distance with it that that's really yeah. really useful. And guys, never forget. It was mostly, not all the time, but most people had the bazu band here. Uh, let, me, here. Let, me, let me bring up a photo of that. Yeah. Okay, not this one, obviously. Coming up. Uh, Yes, it was mostly used with that. So basically, basically, this, if you look at the big plate, right, it covers your complete arm. And it's actually used in conjunction with your uh, small shield, Sepa. Yeah. Okay, so that's uh, basically male and uh, a plate going around the arm, yeah? And some Bazuban didn't even have the male protection on the hand. So if you put it in the shield and you have only those plates, you see, Car. Yeah. And no, no sword can cut through that plate. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, That's definitely. Sure. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, so uh, let me just put a link to your site on the uh, chat again. Okay, before we close off, would you, uh, is there anything you would like to uh, tell our viewers or... Uh, Oh, I mean, I mean, it was a long talk. I hope uh, they, uh, your viewers enjoyed this. And um, I mean, if they want to train in this, I mean, they can contact us. I mean, we welcome everyone who is interested in training this. And um, well, and <laughs> if you're a researcher, want to do research in this field, this is a bit more complicated. And uh, of course, uh, you, you can contact me if, uh, as, and if you're a researcher already, we can discuss research projects. If you're interested in that, that's not a big deal. And we can discuss that. And uh, yeah, that's what I can say at the moment. I don't know what else I can say. Well, I, can, I do research and fighting and martial arts. I mean, the, and of course, um, analysis of uh, weapons I do, but this you cannot join because you need to have experience for museums, right? Of course, this doesn't work like that. Obviously. Yes. So, uh, anyone watching, if you're interested in uh, weapons and armor and uh, martial arts techniques, definitely head over to uh, Razmafsar TV. Check out the Doctor's channel. It's, uh, I think, it's one of the best resources about the subject on the uh, on YouTube. And if you're interested in the books, uh, I also left the link to uh, the Doctor's online shop there. So, yeah, uh, lots of good reading in here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, God. <laughs> <coughs> So, Doctor, thank you again for your time, and yeah. uh, thanks everyone for watching. Uh, thank you very much. The next stream will be on uh, Saturday 2nd, and we're going to have Professor, Buzuti, uh, Professor Buttigieg from uh, the University of Malta. So, again, thanks everyone for watching, and uh, have a great evening. Bye. Thank you.